Hello, thank you. Welcome, welcome to Perimeter Institute here in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And welcome to Perimeter Institute's public lecture series here live from the Mike Lazaridis Theatre of Ideas. My name is Greg Dick, I'm the Director of Educational Outreach here at Perimeter and it is a pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening, both those of you here in the theatre and those of you watching online. The lecture will last approximately one hour and will be followed by a question and answer session. So for those of you watching online, Dr. Kelly Foyle and a team of researchers are behind their keyboards ready to engage in conversation, follow our Facebook or Twitter feed and use hashtag PI Live. And if you do have a question, get it in early so it can get all the way to my phone in time. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's very special guest speaker. Dr. Verlind is a professor at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of Amsterdam. Professor Verlind is well known for his many contributions to science, which include Verlind algebra and the Verlind formula. He received his PhD from Utrecht University in the Netherlands and completed his postdoctoral work at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He was a staff member at the Theory Division of CERN and also completed professorships at both Utrecht and Princeton universities. In 2011, the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research awarded Dr. Awarded Dr. Berlin the Spinoza Prize, the most uh, prestigious prize a Dutch scientist can win. Dr. Verlin is also very familiar with Perimeter, as he was a member of our Scientific Advisory Committee from 2010 to 2013. In 2010, Dr. Verlin introduced a new approach to the idea of gravity, that it's not a fundamental force, but it's an emergent phenomena. Tonight, Dr. Verlin will explore the core ideas behind his research and examine the implications of this fast emerging revolution of our understanding of the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Verlind to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to be telling you this evening about what I think are exciting developments in theoretical physics. Uh, in our understanding of gravity, we are making progress and we're moving towards, again, a new theory, a new view on gravity that differs from the old theory in the sense that it transcends it. It, it sort of contains it, but it takes a next step. And uh, that's also because there are indeed important questions to be asked or answered uh, about gravity, which have to do with our universe. In particular, there are questions uh, related to dark matter and dark energy, which together I call the dark side of the cosmos. I will be explaining that uh, during the lecture. It's also a timely uh, lecture because uh, yesterday the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for three researchers working on gravity and who together did very important work in making it possible to detect for the first time gravitational waves. And also that I'll explain later more precisely what was being done in this experiment, but this was a confirmation of the theory of Einstein. So Einstein already 100 years ago predicted uh, the existence of gravitational waves. So now the theory is confirmed. You might ask, well, why do we need a new theory? And this has to do with theoretical advances because theory uh, always develops further. It has to do with observations, things we don't understand about gravity, and I'll explain that. But also there's a bit of a philosophical point of view, and I'm gonna start with that one. Because the way that science progresses has very much to do with the times that we live in, and also with the technology that we use. And normally we would say that science helps us to develop technology, but there's also the other way, that our current technology influences the way we think about science. So we go back to the Middle Ages or a little later, we have cannons and think about ballistic motion like cannonballs. And these are objects where we don't even ask the question what they're made of, they just move. And this is how Newton sort of started. Of course, in the, in the 19th century, people made steam engines. And this is where we talk about gases that have pressures and temperature. Even then, people didn't think so much about what is really made of, but slowly one started developing the atom picture. But the, the revolutions that happened in the 19th century were very much related to this existence of the steam engine. 
The previous century, we, uh, well, we developed things like televisions and, and other things. And a television, if you think about what that is, it's actually a, a particle accelerator because it accelerates electrons which are moved around uh, with electric fields and, and are projected on a screen. And then we see photons coming out. So the ideas of forces and particles is really the language of the 20th century. And there, there are understanding of nature was in terms of the most fundamental building blocks, which are elementary particles, and the fundamental forces. So we built theoretical physics using that language. Today, we are already far in the 21st century, and again, we are having a different type of technology. We're having smartphones, we have computers, big data, and most of what we're doing every day has to do with somehow with information. And that's again a new language. And this is again also influencing the way we think about science. So I'm going to tell you that today is that the new view on gravity has to do with information. And because it's basically the language that we're developing in our current uh, century. So we live in an information age, and, but what is information? You might say, well, it's what I read in a newspaper because I'm interested in certain things. But there's also an abstract way to think about information as the way it's stored in terms of bits. And then we don't even look at what is really written somewhere. We just count, for instance, how many bits we have, how many bytes. And so I, I will think about information in this more abstract way. So we're going to even talk about information that we cannot really access, but we still have a way of counting it by saying how many bits I use. There's also another development going on, namely we're going to make things smaller and smaller, and then we're going to look at even subatomic scales or, or atomic scales where things become quantum mechanical. And then information even has another meaning, because in quantum mechanics, you get something called qubits. So not bits like zeros and ones, but there's things that are uh, somewhere in between. So this is Mike uh, Lazaridis, who's indeed already one of the people who invested heavily in the idea of developing quantum computers. And I think here he stands in front of something that has many qubits in it. And qubits uh, are funny objects because they can do things that are only possible in quantum mechanics. They can namely not just be zero and one, but they can be something in the middle. And furthermore, they can uh, do something called an, uh, being entangled in the sense that one qubit here is doing the same thing as somewhere else. And this is a two qubits that are entangled where the zero is on one is combined with the zero on the other or the one on the other is also combined with the one. This is an example of entanglement. So this language we're going to use even in our universe. So we're going to think about the universe in terms of information and also in terms of this entangled quantum information. So my new view on gravity has to do with a new view on the universe built out of information. And we're going to understand, try and understand what then the, the forces, in particular gravity, then comes from from this new language. So this is immediately related to another concept. Again, it's sort of a little bit of a philosophical one. Namely, we used to think in the 20th century that everything can be reduced to the tiniest building blocks. Like we have elementary particles. If we know what elementary particles do and their forces, we can derive everything else. This is a reductionist point of view on nature. We're living in an age where things are changing, where we start realizing that when we build things that are larger, and much more, many things are involved that maybe this reductionist point of view doesn't give all the answers. So let me tell you, ask you, what is this? You probably don't recognize it. It's just a set of pixels. But to show what it is, let me just zoom out a bit. But well, it's the same, same set of pixels, but a little smaller. And now it's a picture where we suddenly see what it is. Of course, this are mountains, is a lake and trees and so on. No, it's a collection of pictures, pixels. And here we have suddenly giving meaning to a collection of objects where microscopically it doesn't exist. And this is the same in nature. If we ask what things are made of, then some of the terms that we use, like maybe even matter or space and time may not exist. And this is sort of where we are going to. And there's, of course, examples uh, in, in nature that are more down to earth, actually already mentioned this. But let me tell you then what the term is. It's called emergence. 
Namely, we use concepts and observe phenomena at macroscopic scales, which are derived from the microscopic scale, but have a priori no meaning in that language. So the language that we use at macroscopic scales is different than the, the microscopic. And we do use concepts and things that are not meaningful, so we have to derive them. We have to define them in terms of what's underlying. So this is an example of emergence in physics. If we look at a room full of uh, gas and, and molecules that are moving around, then we can describe it in terms of temperature. And temperature is a property of all of the gas molecules together, but an individual molecule doesn't have a temperature because actually the temperature is defined as the average energy per molecule. So there we have to define quantities that we normally use, like pressure and temperature, precisely in thermodynamics, from a more statistical perspective on the microscopics. This is an example of emergence. And an important role in this is played, again, by what's called the entropy, which is namely, if I look at all the gas molecules in here, I don't want to know what they're exactly doing, but I can count how many possibilities there are. And that's the entropy that measures the number of possible states that these molecules can be in. And it actually can, tells you the amount of information that's needed to describe all those states. So here we already see a link with information and a quantity called entropy. That uh, link has been made precise by Shannon. If I have bits, so these are coins, it can be zeros and ones, but it can be ups and I mean, all kinds of ways you can make choices. But here I have a coin which has four, well, heads or tails. So there are four possibilities if I have two coins. So there are four possible states. So that's two to the n, if n would be the number of coins. And if you take the logarithm, and here I take the, the log two logarithm, then you count basically the number of these bits. So entropy can be thought of as counting how many bits can I assign to, uh, well, uh, do I need? And um, also entropy can usually be thought of as sort of a measure of chaos. That's about how most people think about it. If there's a gas that does all kinds of funny things, and there's chaotic, chaotic, then we have an entropy associated. This is a state where the yellows are on one side and the blue on the other side. Here they're mixed. Clearly, this has more entropy than that because there are more possibilities. Here also, if all the gas molecules are in part of this box, and here they can move around in more locations, I have more entropy here, also because there's more information needed to describe it. So the link between entropy and information is going to be important. So if I talk about information later on and you wonder what I really mean, it's counting the number of bits. I'm going to introduce this idea of qubits later also because it's going to be also quantum mechanical uh, points are important. And I'm going to end this talk by, of this lecture actually, by explaining you what this has to do with a new view on gravity and also the dark aspects of the universe. And let me show you already a picture that I'm going to explain. It's almost like this picture actually came from the, the poster of my uh, lecture. It's a galaxy according uh, to Einstein's general relativity, curve space time. But I'm going to think about this in a different way, where there's information around it having to do with the dark energy in the universe. And I'm going to explain phenomena that we don't understand about galaxies based on this uh, idea of gravity from information. Now I'm going to start over again. I gave you sort of a summary, uh, an idea of where this lecture is going to. But now I'm going to start at the beginning and really start from gravity through the, uh, the centuries and then get to the end again in this picture. So this was more a philosophical uh, introduction, but now you at least know the concepts that I'm talking about. So I'm going to start again with Newton. So Newton told us how to, gravity works. Of course, Newton explained that uh, the moon and the earth are rotating around each other by the same force that makes the apple fall. And he did this with a thought experiment. He, he had an insight. I told you already about cannons. And actually, he did a thought experiment with a cannon. He thought about a, a, a cannon on top of a hill, which if you shoot the cannonball, it will fall down and hit the earth. But he imagined shooting it given more speed, more velocity, so that it starts falling, and eventually it starts missing the Earth. So while it's falling, it starts going around. So there's a trajectory, actually, it's not drawn here, which is sort of uh, falling down on the Earth. But if you may hit it fast enough, 
you can actually make it go around and eventually come back here. It never goes further down because the energy is conserved and so it comes back to the same point. If you shoot it harder, it becomes a circle and if it then lar larger again as an ellipse. And then there's a, a trajectory where it never comes back. It's a par parabola. And then you have things that are even further out and they, that's, uh, then you escape away. And this uh, idea that falling and going around the Earth was the same thing, that is how we got to the idea that basically the Moon is falling continuously, but it's missing the Earth all the time. This is what it makes it move around. This thought experiment gave him eventually idea also where all these uh, shapes of the trajectories came from, and this gives you also a force law, and this is Newton's famous law of gravity. So uh, the law of gravity is well, probably familiar, uh, it has, tells you that the force is proportional to the size of the masses. I have two big, a big mass, say, and a small one, either the Earth or the Moon, and, or the, the Sun and the, and the Earth. Then you multiply the two masses, so it's proportional to uh, the two masses, but it's inversely proportional to the distance between them. So it goes like uh, 1 over r squared. And that's actually the same way that the size of a sphere grows. And actually, I want to say, Nimi, if I go twice the distance, so this is one distance to the Earth, to the, to the uh, Sun. If I go twice the distance, actually the force goes down by a factor of four, and this is the same way that the area grows, so there's some way in which this goes like one over the area. And I, I actually this area plays an important role in what I'm going to say, because it's going to link to something that has to do with information. Of course, Newton's law has been tested very well, and this is also why people initially didn't doubt it to be right. Because, I mean, you can test it by making its predictions, namely looking at the prediction. Here the uh, um, velocity is actually uh, calculated using uh, Newton's law, and you find that the velocity goes down as a function of the distance. So these are the planets, and you find that uh, at larger distance, the velocity is less. And this has been measured, and this is precisely what the, the measurement does. It follows the prediction of Newton. So this works very well. But then if you go to the planet that's closest to the sun, which is Mercury, there's a tiny deviation. So Newton would have predicted that the um, orbit of uh, any planet has this ellipsoidal shape, and that these two points always are staying at the same location. This does not happen with Mercury, it actually rotates a little bit like that. And it rotates with a few degree per century, or actually less than a degree. But uh, this has to be explained either by changing the law of gravity or by postulating some additional mass. And this is sort of what people did. People thought there might be some additional dark matter or some planet closer to the sun that would explain this and they searched for it for half a century, they didn't find it. Of course, we now know that this is an indication that there's something wrong with Newton's theory. Not really wrong, at least it can be improved. And this is what Einstein did. He explained this phenomena by changing the gravitational law, not by dark matter, but having a different view on gravity. So his view on gravity, and that's a century ago, was that gravity is a consequence of how space and time are curved. This came out of his theory of relativity, where he introduced, well, uh, motion comparable to the speed of light, or he at least made sure that the relativity postulates are consistent with the way that we think about gravity. For instance, that a signal cannot travel faster than light. And then the only way that can be done is if you think about space itself as sort of a dynamical uh, object that can curve, and mass then influences the, the geometry of space-time and curves it in such a way that objects no longer move in straight line but start going in elliptical orbits, at least approximately, because this, if you do this for Mercury, it would actually explain exactly what Mercury is doing, and he calculated this and it confirmed. Actually, his theory got confirmed even very quickly afterwards for another prediction, namely, he also predicted that gravity would bend light. So if space is curved, then light is also affected by gravity, and if there's a star here, then the light would travel if there's a mass between us, not in a straight line, but in a curved line like that. And that has a consequence, because then if we look at it, 
we don't see the star at its location, we see it actually slightly shifted because we always think that light goes straight, and so we see the image there. So light gets bended a bit, and this is an, a consequence of, of um, Einstein's formulation of gravity, and it got confirmed by looking at a solar eclipse uh, already like a century ago. Um, the other prediction, and I mean, indeed, was I said, was the lensing effect. This is related to it because this is where you think about a source here behind the the object. You see light going towards the Earth, but it can go in two ways, or even in many ways, because it can go up or down. And then you see the light from something behind, and actually it makes a ring because it can curve around in all, all directions. And this is called the Einstein ring. It's a beautiful. Uh, Confirmation again of the way that gravity works according to, to Einstein. Now let me now come to the confirmation that I introduced at the beginning, namely his prediction of gravitational waves. So we're going to talk about black holes later, but uh, gravitational waves are waves in the space, the shape of space time itself. Actually, it's it ripples in space and time itself that propagate with the speed of light. I already told you that, that gravity cannot be transmitted instantaneously because then it would go faster than light. So if something happens to gravity, it has to travel out and travel towards us. And one of the most spectacular events that can happen is if two black holes, they are rotating around each other and they start spiraling inward and eventually they merge together. At that moment, gravity waves start traveling outwards and the last bit is such an enormous amount of energy in, in being emitted that those waves, gravity, gravitational waves, can reach us one billion years after it happened. That's really spectacular. For that, they had to do measurements of distances because this, the shape of the space is being changed a little bit, and they had to, do, to build an interferometer uh, to measure these distances, and then they found a signal on about, uh, I think it's the 14th of August, uh, a little more than two years ago, and they had two detectors, one uh, in, in, in Livingston and the other one in Hanford, and they both found a signal. And that is a signal where suddenly they saw that the shape of space changes. It's a signal that oscillates because of the rotation of the, 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 the black holes, but very fast. So the frequency is very high, but at the last moment it goes up even further. And it suddenly makes a, a high frequency burst with high intensity. It's called a chirp. And I'll, I'll show you, actually I'll show you, but also let you hear it. So this is the signal where it goes. Um, this is sort of what, how it builds, so you see the time goes this way and then suddenly it happens. So now if I go the next. This is called a chirp because the, the frequency goes up like a bird. I mean, I like the way that the, the New Yorker sort of made the cartoon the next day. It says, was that you I heard just now or was it two black holes colliding? <laughs> Of course, it was a joke if you only know that the signal's called a chirp, a chirp, and so this is where you have to know some physics. So this was uh, rewarded uh, the Nobel Prize yesterday, and I'm actually going to tell you, show you about a, a quote that I read that Rainer Weiss gave one of the laureates on a, a telephone interview. Namely, this signal is very tiny. I mean, it's really a very tiny stretch. It's less than a millionth of the size of the nucleus of an atom. Quite incredible that they could measure this. And the reason is that it's very hard to change the shape of space. So space is very stiff, enormously stiff. And this has to do also with that this phenomena they looked at has this very short time scale where it goes very fast and very strong gravity with these black holes. So all these phenomena and, and tests of gravity. Um, here I've summarized them a little bit, are described 
and testing, they're testing the equations of Einstein. I've written down these, these equations here. You don't need to be able to understand what I write down, but this is what Einstein wrote down as his law of gravity. And it describes uh, black holes, it describes uh, the radiation from binary pulsars, bending of light and, and things in the solar system. Many ways we've tested this. So why, again, do you need a new theory? And for that, I'm going to do a little experiment where I'm going to show that, uh, indeed, there may be things that we don't understand if we think about it too simplistically. And I'm going to do an experiment which is not with gravity, but it's with elasticity. Namely, elasticity is also about changing the shape of a material. And it has a certain way of describing what's going on by simply saying, if I apply a force, I know exactly how the material changes its shape. So I can even measure a force. So this is a material that bounces, like a bouncing ball. It does it again. Of course, the bounce is very short. But I can measure also the mass, because if I put it down, then there's going to be a small dent in here. If I know the elastic properties, I can calculate from the size of the dent how heavy it is. So I'm going to test if there's some dark matter in here. Because I'm, doing a I'm going to do a test where I put it down. And I'm going to wait what happens to that. If I apply the theory of this elasticity, nothing should happen because the force doesn't change. But something is going to happen very slowly. So suddenly, you start seeing that the laws of physics depend on how you probe a system and on what time scale. I'm going to say that what happens in our dark universe is something that happens at a totally different time scale, and we're going to need a new theory, namely, that's not the theory of elasticity there. Well, the theory of elasticity, of course, is only a theory that we know works when we look at the, the whole object. Because inside there are molecules. And I have to understand what really the stuff is made of to understand what the material is doing. So you have to go to the microscopics and derive the laws of elasticity. And I'm going to do the same thing with gravity. I'm going to go to think about what is space-time made of microscopically. And then depending on its properties, it can either give gravity like general relativity all the time, or it can do something else. And this material is going to do something else, because it's actually going to flow. You can watch it. It's going to actually make a dent deeper and deeper, because it's made out of a polymer that's changing its shape, because these polymers are moving around, but they do it very slowly. This is silly putty, by the way. You can buy it. In the dollar store, actually, I do it once in a while. I go to the dollar store, and I, I couple, buy a couple of them, and that's how I did last week. There are actually tiny eggs that are a little bit in it, but I put some together to make a bigger ball. So if you want to do this experiment at home, just go to the Dollar Tree store, and then you buy it, and, and <laughs> it's fun stuff. So this is where I am going to go now to galaxies. So does gravity work the same at galaxy scale as general relativity would say? Well, some people say, yes, of course. Because Einstein is right. There's no way that he can be wrong, and therefore we apply Einstein's equations here, and we're going to learn things. But the other way you might say, well, let's test it, which is usually the way you should do things. Let's test it. There is a galaxy. We're going to see how they rotate, and we see what the velocities are as a function of the distance. Now here, you see you sort of make a model where you think that everything is going in a circle. We look at the color of the light. We know the redshifts. We can calculate the velocities. And then we see that the velocities start doing this. But then we look at the amount of matter, and most of the matter is in the center. And the same what we did with, it, with the solar system would have predicted that the Newton's prediction would go like that. It doesn't work the same way. I've shown you gravity doesn't work the same way because I did the measurement. This is not what people say. People say, no, it works the same way. There must be more gravity here because it's going much too fast. And they made a fix. Not a tiny planet that explains the deviation of Mercury. No, an enormous amount of matter is going to be added there. And they call it dark matter. And they search for it and search for it, and they don't find it. 
Maybe there's another explanation. So here is again the same experiment. We look at the distance, we look at the way that the velocity goes, and we see a deviation. So this is a Newtonian prediction. Actually, it's very much like the planets were doing, going down. And indeed, because most of the matter here is in the center. So you expect the velocity to go down, that stays constant. It really goes much faster, and it would not stay together if there would not be an additional attractive force. Of course, people say that's because there's more matter, but what is really happening here? Is there more mass that we are missing, or is there a, another explanation? So this is the dark matter hypothesis, is that really that there's some collection of particles around our galaxy and other galaxies that explains this faster rotation. And this is called the dark matter halo. It's shown in blue. That's not the actual color because you cannot see it, but this is an artist's impression. But there might be another explanation, but this is sort of a representation of the fact that there's more gravity needed to keep a galaxy together. So I'm gonna indeed say that this is something to do with the fact that gravity is emergent and we have to understand what is made of more microscopically. There's other evidence that people point out. I mean, there's uh, lensing again at much larger scale. This is lensing of uh, galaxy clusters where you see uh, a cluster, uh, a galaxy on the background being repeated many times. If you see these, these arcs, that's sort of the, the image. And you can calculate how much mass is then needed to explain this. And you find that a much more mass than we see in terms of these galaxies. So this is again seen as evidence for a stronger gravitational acceleration. And therefore people say, if we apply Newton's law here as well, or, or general relativity, we should conclude there's dark matter. And this is then the picture that people develop is that at larger scales in our cosmos, there must be a web of dark matter. And this has to do with how structure, how the galaxies and all these things form. And indeed, you can do these measurements using uh, lensing again. This, this is called the weak lensing map, where you map out where is the gravity and where is the matter, and you see that there's even locations where there's gravity where there's hardly any matter. And this is uh, used as evidence. Even further back, if we look at larger scales, what we do when we look from our planet out into the universe, light has to travel towards us and takes an amount of time to get towards us. That means that we look at objects further away, which are further in the past. So this is, uh, you might say, an image of distances, circles that are bigger, but actually it's also times that are earlier in the past. And there's some furthest distance where we can see, where we see the light coming from what is believed to be the Big Bang, afterglow of the Big Bang. It's called the cosmic microwave background, and this is after that we cannot look any further. So we have a largest distance we can look, and this is the way that people build a current cosmological model. And you can then estimate what is the amount of energy in our universe and the amount of matter. And the result is kind of shocking that uh, if we understand the matter that we are made of ourselves, like protons, neutrons, and everything in the planets and the stars, and we add it all up, it's much less than what is actually needed to explain this universe. So this is the budget for uh, energy and mass together. Actually, I put energy and mass together because E equals mc squared. And then you see that 95% of the energy in the universe is not understood. It's, called, it's sort of missing. Uh, the ordinary matter is this 5%. There's this cosmic microwave background that's also a lot of uh, and, uh, particles, actually. This is this bit, it's less than a percent level, uh, one hundredth of a percent uh, of all of the energy. So the energy in the photons is very little. But most of the matter is dark. That means we cannot see it. It cannot be the kind of particles we are made of. And this is the, the matter that people are looking for. And then there's dark energy, which also is not known really what that is, but it plays a role in explaining the expansion rate of the universe. So the universe expands accelerated way, and that can only be described in a, in a, by adding this additional energy to, to our space. Now, this is already telling me that something may be wrong because we are deriving our laws of physics only based on this part, 
But what do we know about this? And Einstein describes this, by the way, by adding just a constant to his equation. And that adds sort of like 70% of the energy of the universe. I mean, that's a bit of a waste, but... Um, the other thing I already mentioned, this is observational reasons to go beyond the Einstein theory, in my opinion, but the other one is theoretical. I'm going to make now a case that the equations that Einstein wrote down can actually be indeed derived in a way similar to thermodynamics. And this is where this story of emergence, gravity, and the link with information are, are, is going to come from. And for that, I'm going to go back to the topic of black holes, namely black holes give us the hints of why there is a connection between gravity and information. So black hole is where all the matter is located in this very tiny part of space, so small that uh, the matter collapses on itself and gravity becomes so strong that light cannot even escape. So black holes have a horizon, sort of an imaginary sphere around it, that if you would go beyond that, then there's no way to escape. So they have a size, and that depends on the mass that you put in. A larger black hole, a more massive one, is also bigger. By the way, the black holes that collided in these, these uh, gravity waves are like 60 times the mass of the sun. So there's really a lot of mass in those. And they are big objects, like tens of kilometer, kilometers or, or maybe much more even. And actually, there are in the center of galaxies even much larger ones. So black holes exist. That's a prediction of, of Einstein. But as theorists, we like to think about it as objects where we can learn a lot about gravity because they're the most extreme. And this horizon is going to play a very important role in understanding more about gravity. So let me give you a little bit of a feel what is going on. So I told you that if, the, if I take the, the, the shape of uh, the, the space-time, when we have a mass sitting there, you can actually compare this to a sheet of rubber where we put some mass locally and we get some dent in it. Actually, here is some analogy with elasticity already happening. The mass is really creating the deformation of the space-time. But when the matter gets more concentrated, this gets deeper and deeper, and there's some limit where you just get a hole. That's where the black hole appears, and then there is some distance where light can no longer escape. So I want to show you a little bit what it looks like to be close to a black hole. Uh, black holes also curve light just like other objects did, and, and they bent light. So if Earth would be rotating around a black hole, it looks like this. You might get worried that Earth is being deformed here. That's not what's happening. This is the image of what it looks like, because Earth, when it comes back to the front, is just nicely round. But the image of Earth gets projected around with the light, where you can see the ring. But that was the Einstein ring that I talked about. It's just a light going around. Now I'm going to show you what it looks like if you fall into a black hole. It's an image I, I took from the internet. I should have uh, acknowledged the, the person who did this, but uh, I forgot. But anyway, this is a uh, simulation. We're not going to do it for real. Uh, so it's done with the equations. And actually, no one has fallen into a black hole, so I cannot really verify that this is true. We have had all of a kind of discussions, really, what happens when we fall into a black hole, whether the horizon is really something you can fall through. We're going to see that we're going to be able to do it. So we're using Einstein's equations and then see what happens. So a number of things are going to happen. So there's a picture, and we're going to go around it, the black hole. There's a certain distance where you can simply make circles. You don't have to do anything. But when you get closer, there's some moment when you get drawn into the black hole, and you have to use an uh, acceleration, it's like a rocket engine, to stay out. Then there's a distance when there's no stopping anymore, you're falling in, and you eventually will cross the horizon, and when you cross the horizon, you continue, but you will go to the center and hit the singularity. But the horizon is a special location because light cannot be emitted from that anymore, and also because clocks start going differently. The time stops, basically, at the horizon. So we're going to see a clock, here, that's going to keep track, and that's going to go slowly. So I'm going to show you what's happening. So here we go. Actually, the picture, or maybe I should show this first, tell this first. Well, we, we do want to see it again. The picture actually was the galaxy, and it's being deformed by as a lens. So we have here the horizon appearing, 
Strangely enough, the north and the south pole are a little bit off, and that's because, again, of the curvature, uh, the bending of light. And we are there still in a safe regime, which is yellow, but now we have to start using the engine. And we set it closer and closer. Eventually, we're going to go through it. And uh, then, indeed, you see that we have no connection anymore with, with the outside. And this is where there's no stopping us from falling on the singularity, and eventually time stops. I'm going to show this again because most people want that. So there we go again. So this indeed was a galaxy, and this is an Einstein ring because it's the way that the light gets around. And then we see the horizon appearing. And so this is where light actually is going around. And there's one particular distance which is called the photosphere where light just makes circles. We see a flash when that happens because that's not the horizon itself. The horizon is here. And this is where you need the north and the south pole. And um, they have not drawn what's inside, basically because it's unknown. So now we're inside, and, and we can only look outward. And we can still see a bit of the light coming in. Actually, light can still go into a black hole, but it cannot go out. So you can still see where you came from, but there's no way to communicate back to people outside. So it's fun to think about black holes, and this is also why uh, the um, theorists do thought experiments near black holes. And two famous people, uh, Stephen Hawking, well, well known here, of course, and uh, Jacob Bekenstein. They both thought about black hole horizons, and they wanted to know more properties, like the thermodynamic properties. If I throw in a box with, uh, radi with gas particles in it, it has an entropy. This is where the connection with information is going to come from because we want that the laws of thermodynamics are still true. Turns out that also the laws of quantum mechanics are going to play a role. And indeed, what um, Bekenstein and Hawking showed is that if you throw in some, some matter in a box, some gas, the horizon gets bigger, but the entropy in the box disappears. But entropy always has to increase. And they made the assumption that was actually Bekenstein that the horizon area has to do something with the amount of information that you throw in, the, the entropy. Bekenstein did this calculation using quantum mechanics, and he found a very surprising result. Namely, black holes, nothing can escape. But it turns out, quantum mechanically, it emits radiation. And actually, it gets smaller. And the reason is, is that in quantum mechanics, you have the uncertainty principle that there is a possibility of creating pairs of particles in the vacuum. And they are a particle and an antiparticle where one drops in the black hole and the other one escapes. Normally, in empty space, they would reunite again and they just annihilate each other. But here, one drops in and the other one escapes and you get radiation coming out. So this is the picture here. It's also where these two particles near the horizon, they, one escapes and one falls in. But if they are not on the horizon, then they can combine again. And this is going to be telling us something about the properties of this black hole, namely that it has a temperature, because this radiation is thermal radiation. And if we have a temperature and we have a mass and therefore an energy, we also have an entropy. And that entropy is a formula that Bekenstein already wrote down, namely the, that it's proportional to the area. So it has thermodynamic properties, precisely the quantities that I introduced as being emergent. The temperature and an entropy. And the entropy for a black hole is proportional to the area of its horizon. This is, was one of the more important discoveries, actually already 40 years ago they made this. And I think it is the first crack in Einstein's theory. Nothing is perfect, and actually that's one of my storylines, is that every theory eventually gets replaced by a better one, and you have to look at the right clues of where to look, and you find that the black hole entropy formula tells you something about what is the microscopic origin of gravity. By the way, I already said that Newton's law had something to do with areas. This area of the black hole horizon is the same area I'm actually going to talk about. So there is a entropy formula that tells us how much information is contained in a black hole. And we're going to think about this information as bits. I told you information for me is bits. It also can be measured by entropy because that tells us how many bits there are. And this is why this formula tells us how many bits we can associate with a black hole. 
Not ordinary bits, by the way. It's going to be quantum qubits a little later. So the information that is associated with black holes is not the information that we have classically on a computer. It's going to be the next computer. Actually, a black hole is the best computer you can have because you can store an enormous amount of information on it. Namely, the density here is the Planck scale. Try building a chip like that. This is where the limit is. This is how much information you can store on, on, on a surface. And it's, as I said, not ordinary bits. It's quantum information. And now let me explain a little bit more about what that is. I already said that bits are zeros and ones. Uh, quantum bits, they are also zeros and ones. But you can also think about it as the spin of an electron, for instance. The spin of an electron can be either up or down. But it can also be something in the middle. And we call that a superposition. So it has to decide still whether it's up or down before I do a measurement. And this is why a qubit has many more possibilities. So a bit has only two possibilities, zeros and one. A qubit can be thought of as a sphere. All points on this sphere is a different state of a qubit. And this is why if you do calculation with qubits, you're doing many calculations at the same time. Many more bits than we normally have in a classical computer. In a quantum calculation, you do all these things parallel. All calculations are being done at the same time. This is why quantum computers are much more powerful. More uh, importantly, these qubits can be entangled. I already mentioned what that is, namely that if I measure two qubits, that the outcome is the same. This was discovered, let me do the calculation, it's uh, like 80 years ago by, again, a familiar name, Einstein, together with two colleagues. Actually, you may wonder why Einstein does something with quantum mechanics, because he didn't like it. Well, this was also motivated to show that there's something very funny about quantum mechanics, namely that if you measure an object and you measure the spin here, it de can determine the outcome of a measurement somewhere else instantaneously. He called the spooky action at a distance, and he said, this cannot be. This paper was not that important at the time, but in recent times, it's one of the most important papers because it's the first paper where they explained entanglement very clearly. And this is what makes entangled qubits. It makes, it's the power of quantum mechanics. It's the essence of quantum mechanics that we have entanglement. And our universe is very entangled. And so this is why this is the kind of information we're talking about. So it's a property of the quantum bits. And actually, it's something that is already there before you start measuring it. It tells you that if you do a measurement here, that something else happens somewhere else. So this is already the qubits that I showed before. I mean, this is where indeed you have a zero and a zero. If you do a measurement of this one, it can be either a zero or a one. So here, and the other one uh, here, the other measure outcome might be a one, but the, the outcome is always the same. So if I measure this one as a zero, then this one will be zero as well. And if it's a one, the other one is one. But a priori, there's 50-50 prob probability when I do the measurement. So this is called entanglement. And I'm going to denote this by this picture of a sphere by connecting a little line between it. So entanglement is like a connection between two of those qubits. So I'm connecting qubits together, and this is the way I'm going to build spacetime. So this is going to be my microscopic picture of the molecules of spacetime. So this is what uh, Bekenstein and Hawking calculated. They calculated that there was an entropy associated to horizons. And this has to do precisely with this pair creation, because here we are creating an, a, a pair of entangled particles. And they describe the amount of information. So the entangled qubits is really what's being counted by, by this formula. So this is the answer. So what is this entropy counting? It's entangled qubits. And they are the building blocks of space-time. And they are measured by the area. But I'm going to say it's the other way around. Actually, the amount of qubits is going to determine the geometry, and it's going to determine the area. So the geometry of Einstein is going to be derived from this language. So and this is go as far as I want to go, at least explaining the ideas. This is a current state-of-the-art kind of development going on in theoretical physics, thinking about gravity in terms of quantum information and deriving its laws just the same way as we derive the laws of thermodynamics. And that's called emergent gravity. And this is where I want to connect now final slides uh, to the dark universe. So 
There's a, a slight summary. Uh, space, time, and gravity are emergent. And this is actually a lesson we learn not from just black hole physics. I didn't tell you about string theory because I have only that many minutes to talk. But string theory itself also actually hints in the same direction. A lot of what we're learning nowadays comes from studies in string theory where we also see that this emergence of gravity from quantum information is very natural. This is all theoretical physics. And you might say, well, why are we doing it? Are we learning anything new? And in particular, is there an observational evidence? So one thing that uh, I have to mention is that we have to rederive first the laws that we already know from this idea. This can be done. And I wrote a paper already about seven years ago, a little more, which was called On the Origin of Gravity and the Laws of Newton, because that's one of the laws you want to derive. And what I showed here in this paper, that indeed if you assume that the amount of information, this entanglement, is proportional to the area, that's an assumption, by the way, then you can derive Newton's law. Just by using the same tricks that we use to derive thermodynamics. So there is Newton's law. And here is this picture of the information stored on a surface. And we find indeed the one of our R squared law because the area, it grows like the area. This, by the way, as I said, is an assumption. And you may wonder whether this assumption is true. And this is where the possibilities are maybe to explain what's going on here. So now I'm going back to my original question. Is there some way that something strange or different happens in this galaxy? I already told you that the observations tell us that something different happens. But can we also explain this theoretically? Indeed, I'm going to say there are different laws acting here. Because the laws that we have currently derived, Einstein's equations, are derived from observations that we have done in the previous century, colliding black holes, lots of stuff. But if you think about this question here, how long have we been observing the universe? If you think about the history of the Earth, actually this was uh, from a... From a um, slide actually from the internet, I could have put the universe here. The history of the universe, if we would take that to be one year, then humans only arrived one minute before midnight on the 31st of December. And how long have we been doing science? Fraction of a second. It's like taking a snapshot of the history of the universe and then drawing conclusion about its entire history. I showed you this experiment. The snapshot was the bounce. What happens to the universe is this, and there's a lot of dark matter in here because it's created an enormous dent. If I would apply my theory of elasticity to this, I would have drawn the wrong conclusions. So if the universe has this kind of slow dynamics happening at very large scales, we can explain these phenomena. And now let me go back to the picture here about what we don't know about the universe. This is what we have used. And let me ask you the question, according to current theory, where is all the information sitting in this picture? Any idea? That little tiny yellow stuff. It's the photons in the CMB. That carries most of the information according to current theory. I think that's wrong. All of the information is contained there. Most of the information. And then we have a totally different way of thinking about it. We're missing most of the entropy. This number is 10 to the 90. That's the number of bits you would need to describe the photons. This number, I claim, is 10 to the 120, because that's the size of the horizon of our universe if we would have only dark energy. So this is going to be the conclusion. I'm going to think about our universe as if we are living inside a giant black hole, which has a horizon, except we are not outside the, the black hole, we're inside. Why do we can think about the universe as a black hole with a horizon? Is because of the following fact. We know, according to Hubble, that things move away from us with faster velocity when we go further distances. So objects further away move further 
with higher velocity. So this is Hubble's law. The velocity is proportional to the, the constant, the constant of Hubble, times the distance. So there is a distance when this would become the speed of light. And things that are moving faster than the speed of light, we cannot see. So there's a furthest distance we can see, and therefore we have a horizon, which distance is given by, well, you take the velocity to be c, and you divide by h, so this is the distance to the horizon. If we would be in a universe which is constantly just expanding according to the Hubble law. This tells us then the size of the horizon, the size of the universe, and actually also the size of the number of bits I need, namely it's going to be the size of this horizon, again, measured in Planckian units. I'm going to claim this is information associated not to the horizon itself, but to the dark energy. There's an observational fact. Well, maybe I should uh, tell you the picture first. So I'm going to explain what happens in galaxies' rotation curves. Namely, there's information contained in the dark matter energy. The matter actually pushes it away. It's like elasticity pushing it away. It creates a hole in it, but entropy wants to move back. It sort of wants to increase. It pushes back. I've done a calculation. If you don't believe me, I should take this aside because all the equations are on the blackboard. <laughs> These are the equations of a paper I wrote about a year ago that does a calculation where at the end of it, I'm going to explain the, the data that are here. And let me already tell you a curious fact that should be a, been a smoking gun for why this is the right explanation. If you look at this curve here, so this is what Newton would have predicted, and this is what we observe. Turns out that the deviation always happens at a very particular gravitational acceleration, independent of the size of the galaxy. If you calculate or measure, I should say, that acceleration, turns out it's related to the Hubble parameter, which is very mysterious because the galaxy is a very tiny object, so what would that relation be? I explained that in that paper, and the formulas are like here. So I use entropy, the temperature, entanglement. Eventually, a formula comes out that describes this behavior, and precisely the flattening of these rotation curves with this velocity of acceleration in there. So these ideas are connected to observations, and I think this is proof that quantum entanglement is the origin of gravity. Then you may ask, what is it good for? <laughs> I get that question a lot. I always show this one. One of the questions I think we're going to change. I do think that this is a new view of gravity, but also of the cosmos. And we are interested, always have been interested in the question, where did it all come from? That's a question that drives our curiosity, and it takes us from science to technology and back again. And it brought us from the period of the caveman to our current time. And it's therefore the driving force of what we are doing. Curiosity about nature, and then in the meantime developing technology as well. So this is, I think, also for me, my motivation. And maybe what we learn about understanding about quantum information and the universe will help us also apply it in some real things that is good for us. All right, thank you very much. That was terrific. That was... All right. Let's open the floor to questions. That was terrific. So the microphone for the theater audience is right there. You can form a line. And the online audience, if my phone works, well, I'll get that updated too. But if I get to go first, I'm happy to go first. All right. No questions. I must be. There will be questions. OK. So th let's start with this one. So what, what first inspired you? To, to become a physicist, and then the part B is, what prepared you to ideate, ideate something that goes so against the grain? Um, I, um, as a teenager, actually, I watched the documentary where Stephen Hawking uh, was already 
in it explaining about black holes. And my future thesis advisor, uh, Gerard at Hoofd, was in it too, explaining about elementary particles. That was in the mid 70s. It's, uh, the program was called The Key to the Universe. I was 14 years old and decided I wanted to do this. So, this is what I started doing. And in particular, the question about black holes and, and entropy is something that Gerard Hoofd and Stephen Hawking discussed around for many decades, and I joined in. And I felt uh, a number of things that um, the, f the connection with thermodynamics already told me something about the emergence of gravity. But I have to admit, I always felt a certain unease with the way that people have extrapolating our current laws of gravity to describe the evolution of the universe and come with a very illogical thought, namely that there was a moment that suddenly from nothing it exploded. So I think that is a question that I want to eventually understand differently. And I think this idea of emergence sort of grasp, I find this philosophically much more appealing than the way that that's been done. So I feel there's something to be done, and I have been making progress on black hole physics and other people have with string theory that I feel that we are on the, onto something. So I'm excited about that. Thank you. Let's go to the, in the theater right here. Um, going against a uh, standard model of cosmology, you must come across all the objections. Do you address in any of your papers the objections like the power spectrum of uh, the CMB and uh, bullet clusters and all those other so secondary the, evidence? Yeah, so the bullet cluster I, I already uh, addressed, I actually gave a talk this afternoon where I explained some more of the details uh, about this, but also what I explain here. Uh, so one thing that happens is if you um, think about how Einstein changed gravity from Newton, he didn't take Newton's law and uh, write down a new force law. He had a totally different concept on where it came from. And so what people are doing now is excluding the possibility that we take Einstein's equation and write some other equation. The thing that really is changing is that's a totally new concept, and it has to do with the slow dynamics that's taking place. So there's no immediate connection between the location of the matter and whatever the gravitational field is. That can have a delay in it. And actually the collision like the bullet cluster can be explained in that way. And I also feel like the reason why people um, try to exclude these possibilities, I think is in part because they uh, allow themselves only a limited class of possibilities. If you want to so how should I say this? If you think already what kind of modification there could be to GR, many of them are probably not correct, but there might be one. And we have to think, uh, I do think we have to think out of the box because these problems are, are large ones and we don't know yet where the answer is entirely, but I think to make a business out of excluding other people's idea, somehow I don't think that that's my way of doing things. I like to construct things, not destruct them. Theater. If energy can't be destroyed, then what happens to the energy contained inside virtual particles when they disappear? Ah, good question. <laughs> So there's a certain um, moment, so there is uncertainty, and that means the following. If I look at a, a system very long, I know that energy, I can measure it. But if I look at it very short, I don't know really what the amount of energy is in there. And that's what Heisenberg taught us, that there's a certain uncertainty in how short you look at this object and what the amount of energy is in there. So for a short amount of time, Space can borrow a little bit of energy as long as it gives it back a little later. And that's sort of the, the, the way that it that happens. And uh, it's like um, you cheat with energy conservation as long as others don't notice it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to uh, an online question. Uh, so, would the discovery of dark matter invalidate the th your theory or would some parts of it survive? So that is also a good question. I mean, I don't say that there are no other particles to be discovered. The dark matter particle has to be a very special kind. 
namely it has a particle that does not decay, it has to stay around, and we have to explain why there is the amount that we observe. And many people say it may not be one particle, so they can add one or the other. So what I will say is that we can discover new particles, but it should not give us so much more matter in the form of particles that it starts uh, changing the way that my equations work, because then indeed these, these ideas are wrong. Uh, it's true that uh, there are still many steps to be taken, so, um, but I can indeed quite confidently say that I, I really think there will be no particle found, and if it happens, I will have to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> Thank you. In theater. Uh, this may demonstrate my ignorance, but uh, if information, the amount of information is directly proportional to area, can we explain space-time in terms of 2D rather than 3D? Um, also a very good question. I mean, certainly things that we have um, been working on is a model, what we call holography. So a holography is indeed a projection of a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional plane. And then you would say that all the information that is contained necessary to describe what's happening in that space can be recast on, in terms of two dimensions. So this is a, a theory that came also out of string theory. There's a, a space which has not positive dark energy, but negative cosmological constants called, instead of the sitter, it's called anti -de sitter. This is precisely a space where everything seems to live on the boundary, and we're trying to reconstruct what's going on inside for already two centuries, sorry, two centuries, for two, two decades. And that is also taking a lot of uh, difficulty. And, and I say that's not the space we live in, not the universe we live in. So what I did here actually was show that not all the information is actually really living on the boundary, but is also filling up the volume. It still satisfies this area law that if you add it all up, gives you exactly the size of your horizon. So I, I think I would hate if the laws of physics would be eventually so that I have to construct what's happening in this room from some two-dimensional surface on the boundary of our, our universe. That would be not a very practical way of doing things. And I have a feeling that this is also not going to be the final answer. Anyway, so there's, it's a little bit of a subtle uh, issue because we're still in the middle of uh, this development. Maybe I could show you this next slide even because there's a bit of uh, this picture. This is the picture I mentioned, which is where there's a, a theory on the boundary that's describing something happening in the bulk, which has um, the volume, which is, has gravity inside. But this is then the hologram that we're talking about. And string theorists are doing this kind of stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Eric Verlinz. Thank you. Thank you.